We'll begin in 2 Corinthians 5 in just a moment. If you want to turn there, 2 Corinthians 5, it's a good day to be together and to worship God. It's a wonderful morning to come out and to encourage each other and to praise God and give Him the honor that is due His name and laud that name above all names. And you've been an encouragement to me this morning. I'm thankful that you're here, and I pray that we can study together and benefit from God's Word as it is proclaimed. The Apostle Paul was very confident about possessing the resurrection body. He would say in Philippians chapter 3 that it was his aim to attain to the resurrection. While all would be raised, Paul wanted to be raised to incorruption and light. He wanted to be raised to be like his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He wanted to receive that transformed body that would be able to, by God's will, to inherit the eternal kingdom of heaven. But there was a lot that he faced in his life, especially as an apostle, but just as a Christian that threatened him and that made his life on earth very difficult. But the reason he did not give up is because he had that confidence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he talks about all that he had to endure as an apostle of the Lord. He talks about how he had been hard-pressed on every side. He was perplexed. He was struck down. He was carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. This is what he committed his life to. He describes it as a treasure his ministry, the gospel that God entrusted to him as a treasure in an earthen vessel so that the power may not be of us, the excellence may not be of us, but of God. That's certainly what his life demonstrates. But it also exemplifies to us how we must live our lives on this earth, though we may not be apostles, obviously. We are disciples of the Lord, as Paul was, and we need to live that life in all its difficulty, with all its tests and trials by faith. He had confidence. That confidence is wrapped up in that word, faith. He explains in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 5, So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith. Not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be present or absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's a fundamental aspect of discipleship. We have to have faith. We have to live by faith. We have to walk by faith. That means every action, every thought I have on a day to day basis must be coming from faith and It's similar in my mind to our discussions that we've been having in our Bible class in the auditorium on authority. There's a lot of people that misunderstand authority, so they act as though we we do a lot of things, not only as a church, but as individuals without authority, that we don't have to have authority for everything we do. But actually we do. The king controls everything in our individual lives and as a collective body of Christians, the church. But we got to understand what that looks like and how that means. So we discuss things like generic authority where there is something that we are shown to have permission to do that would include a bunch of these other things and they're not specifically indexed in Scripture. Well, it's kind of that way with faith as well. Everything that we do must be done by faith. Everything that we do and everything that we think all the decisions of our life from the smallest ones to the greatest of ones need to be done by faith. And when push comes to shove, that's when our faith is really tested. It's in the biggest moments that we think of. But we've got to train ourselves to act on faith. In Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul showed a danger that we have as those who inhabit flesh that is prone to sin, that is going to be tempted on a daily basis to sin, though it's not sinful inherently. It's faced with temptation every day. And before he talks about the works of the flesh and then the fruit of the Spirit, he told them the fundamental basis upon which each of these lists is found. 
He says in verse 16 of Galatians 5, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The way the world lives is they act on impulse. They do what they wish. They're, there's no governing factor for them. And even when they understand in certain areas of life concepts of authority and they realize there are things that are illegal for them to engage in, so they wouldn't do it because they don't want to go to jail. When it comes down to it, they're their own master. And so they act on impulse. If I want, I get. If I decide that it's what's best for me to do, then I do. But what Paul is laying out here is that you're not the captain of your own ship. You're not the master of your own life. You're not your own Lord. The Holy Spirit gives us things that we must live by. And in any and every decision, thought, situation, and action, we've got to question whether or not that's what God wants from us. And that takes hard work. But everything we do must be done with a what saith the Lord, as we might say. Faith is a constant choice. It's a constant activity and presence of mind. We need to act on faith. But as I mentioned, that doesn't just come naturally. What comes naturally is I feel something and I want something. And so I go get it. That's walking according to the flesh. Acting on faith is completely different. It's not something natural to our flesh. It's, it's something that takes training and learning. It's something that takes conditioning. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4, you'll remember that Peter is talking about the brethren there and their need to live moral lives. But he says something interesting there that they will think it strange the Gentiles, that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, and they'll speak evil of you because of it. And so it's, it's strange. It's not something normal to everyday life as simply a human being that inhabits flesh. What's normal for a Christian is not normal for just a person in the world. And so it's taken us learning to get to that point to act that way. What the world is described as, the false teachers in Second Peter they're described as being presumptuous and self-willed. They're, they're described as natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. They just act like animals. They do what they want. They act on their feelings. But we are not to walk according to the flesh. For the flesh is, has desires that are according to the flesh that are contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit has desires for us. And those two things are most times, if not every time, incompatible. There are things that we have urges to do that God get, grants us authority to do within their certain sphere, but even then that's acting according to the Spirit and acting by faith. The Apostle Paul really nails down the process of this conditioning of ourselves to act on faith in Romans 12 when he says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means that when we become transformed, our minds are renewed by the will of God, then what becomes our impulse is what the Spirit teaches. We might call it second nature to do the will of God, where as we mature in Christ, there are split-second decisions we have to make at times, and then some that we can just make quickly with confidence because we know what the will of the Lord is. Other times takes a little bit more effort, takes some time digging, but we've conditioned ourselves to realize that I've got to find the answer here and not just do whatever comes to my mind at first. I've got to know what the will of the Lord is. And as I renew my mind with God's will, then I can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do I act on faith on an everyday basis? and all the big decisions and little decisions, I think the way we condition ourselves to do that is first, acknowledge God. You're not going to be able to act on faith without acknowledging Him. Remember in Hebrews 11, this great list of people who acted on faith throughout their lives and witnessed to the fact that God is pleased with people who live like this. But the key to their life of faith is found in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, 
when the Hebrew writer says, without faith, is it, is, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's acknowledging God. I believe that he is. But further than that is the acknowledgement that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we're not thinking about the fact that we have a creator every day and that that creator wants us to seek him, then we won't be able to act on faith. The Apostle Paul told the men of Athens that God created humankind and pre-appointed the times of their boundaries and dwellings so that they should seek the Lord and the hope that they might grope Him and find Him, for He is not far from each one of us. We were created by that one we acknowledge to find Him in the most intimate ways as we seek Him by faith. If I'm not thinking about that, that I was put on this earth to seek Him every day when I go to school, when I go to work, when I'm with my family, when I'm by myself, I'm not going to successfully act on faith. You remember what David said, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him. You've made him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, given him dominion over all that we see. What? Why? What's man? Man is made in God's image. Man is the, the crowning jewel of God's creation for the express purpose of following God, of fearing him. And keeping his commandments, Solomon concludes in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. We got to first acknowledge God. And what that does is it allows us to reflect on ourselves in relation to him. I belong to God, so I must live for him. You know, that would always allow us to reach a point of humility because we realize how small we are in comparison to God. That we're like grasshoppers before Him. It's not about us, it's about Him. And so acknowledging God leads us to a humility and even acknowledging His power. All of these things allow us to act on faith. You remember how God answered Job as he wondered why he was going through what he was going through and he had some questions about that and God answered him and challenged him in Job chapter 38. In a very dramatic fashion, uh, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And the first question is, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And and they keep getting radical and and. And ridiculous in in the scope that Job would even know anything about these things. And that's the whole point. I'm God. And if you meditate on what that actually means, that I've created, that I've got infinite power and infinite wisdom, that allows you to find your place before me. Act on faith. And Job learned that lesson at the end of this very important book. He said in verse 2 of chapter 42, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. When I, when I acknowledge God and I see what He's done and all that He accomplishes and I realize His power, I'm, I'm finding my own place of subserviency to Him, of submission to Him. But in conjunction with that, I am finding strength to do what He's created me to do. How do I accomplish what God puts me forth to accomplish? I've got to think about Him. And when I think about Him, I think about His power and realize that I'm just merely a cog in His machine. I'm I'm here to do His will, and He's got the power to accomplish His will. So everything's sounding pretty good, isn't it? And all of these logically follow. I'm acknowledging God so that I can condition myself to act on faith. I'm acknowledging His power. And then I'm starting to acknowledge His character. And that's important too. Paul told Timothy to remind the brethren that if we are faithless, that God remains faithful because He can't deny Himself. Some say what that means is that it doesn't matter how much you sin after you've become his child, he's going to save you anyways. That's not what that's saying. What it's saying is really the exact opposite. 
you've become his child, but if you fail in faith toward him and you leave him and forsake him, he's not going to change his will to save you. His will stays the same. He cannot deny his will. He cannot deny his character. He cannot deny his nature. And, and if we think about him, we're going to realize how holy he is and that he's not just lenient toward sin and lenient toward error but that he has a specific will and the power to accomplish it, and we must submit to it fully. And then I think about that. I'm equipping myself to always make the right decision, to act on faith. Notice in Deuteronomy chapter 7 what it says about the character of God. And in all of that, there's always what we would describe as the positive and the negative. Like in Romans 11, Paul talks about the goodness and severity of God. We've got to realize both. Both of them motivate us to do His will, and both of them condition us and train us to act on faith in everything. There in Deuteronomy chapter 7, when Moses is telling the people, listen, you're God's people, and He's giving you this land to inhabit, and and you're going to find success, and and you are meant to follow and serve Him. You are a holy people. He tells them in verse 9, Know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations to those who love Him and keep His commandments. Pause there. What would that do for you if we started to truly grasp that and digest it on a daily basis. That God's faithful to His people. He's reliable. We'll talk about that in our next lesson, Lord willing. He's he's trustworthy. He's one that follows through with His promises. He's one that loves us and wants the best for us. And so He'd never send us out on an impossible mission, and He'd certainly never send us out on a mission that would inherently hurt us and harm us. If I'm thinking about God and His character, I'm realizing that He wants what is best for me. He would never mislead me. He would never hurt me. And He'll never forsake me. What's that going to do to every one of my decisions? Will I doubt God? Not if I'm thinking this way. Will I decide to do something contrary to His will? Not if I'm thinking about how much He loves me and how faithful He is to me how much He's promised me and how consistent He's been. But there's always the flip side we need to realize as well to God's character in regard to what He will do to people in His faithfulness who forsake Him. He repays, verse 10, those who hate Him to their, to, to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. And so there's not just one answer to this. Do we serve God and love him because he'll punish us if we don't? Yes. That's going to take you far, but only so far. But if I know he's faithful and I can trust him with my everything and I I will be blessed by him and changed by him and I'll receive an inheritance by him because he who promised is faithful, that's going to take me as far as I need to go. And I can't let go of either thought of God's character. There's far too little meditation on God. We need to think less of self, less of everyday activity, and more about God. You don't have to have an open Bible to think about God. You need to meditate Him. We've got to think about Him continually throughout the day. Pray to Him. Contemplate His nature and His character and how that relates to me. And that's going to help us act on faith. And lastly, it does boil down to knowing His will. How do you know anything about God other than His existence? without His revealed Word. Romans, or or Psalm 19 tells us about that. Yes, the heavens declare His handiwork. It shows us His creative power and Godhead in Romans 1. But then He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So we've got this general revelation in creation, but we don't know His character. 
We don't know his will. We don't know what he expects of us. And therefore, we can't act on faith without his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I know we we repeat that over and over and over again, but it's got to be more than just a maxim. It's got to be more than just a memory verse, something we throw out there when we're talking about authority with our friends in the world. It's got to be something we live every day when we talk about faith, when we sing about faith, when we encourage each other to grow in our faith. This is what we're talking about. It's not simple intellectualism either. It's not knowing God's word. It's being convicted in God's word and living God's word and breathing God's word. That's how we know God. And if we acknowledge his word, we're acknowledging him. And if we're doing that on a daily basis, not just saying studying your Bible daily, well, that's a good thing to do, but thinking about his will daily in all your decisions, with all your thoughts, you will be acting on faith and you'll be bearing fruit in its season. Psalm 1 talks about meditating on the law of the Lord day and night and and you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf does not wither and whatever he does will prosper and he brings forth its fruit in its season. I think that partly what that means is that there are different seasons of life. There are different opportunities. There are different categories of our life where God would expect us to do this here or do this here. And you might wonder, how do I sort through all that? How do I know that at any given time, in any given circumstance, that I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do in this unique situation? Well, if I'm thinking of his will and I'm meditating on it in relation to my life, the fruit will always be on the tree when it's intended to be on the tree. It won't be out of season. It won't be missing. It will be there. Psalm 119, 105 says that his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We walk by faith, not by sight. And the way we see is with God's word. Let me offer you two things that we need to think about in regard to this application of acting on faith. Not on sight, not on what's right in front of us, but as we acknowledge God, his power, his character, and his word, that's equipping us to make the right decisions every time we're tempted. And I think that there's various ways we could take this, but if we're acting on faith, thinking about God and his will and his character and his power and his word, then we're going to be thinking about temptation very differently. And and that's why it's taking training and conditioning to do this in any given moment, because Because young Christians, babes in Christ, those who haven't grown to this extent, they can be blindsided. But mature Christians, and as we grow in Christ, ought to be thinking in any given situation, what is the Lord's will? And so they realize that here's a temptation to do what is against God's will. And and they're still going to have that urge to go ahead and do what God has not authorized to do. But if we're acting on faith, what we do is we break down what is actually happening. That, that we wouldn't be able to perceive just initially, but that Scripture tells us about. Notice in James 1 and verse 13, he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So the first thing that we got to understand is that if what I'm desiring to do here is against God's will, what the Bible says, then it doesn't come from him. That's, that's as simple as it is. So when people are tempted to do something, tempted to act in some way, and, and they know what the scripture says about it, they want to do it though, so they start trying to reason through it, rationalize that decision. That won't happen if we're acting on faith. This isn't coming from God. God doesn't point us to evil. But then notice in verse 14, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So is this desire from the spirit or from me? Or is my desire more specifically the spirit's desire? And if it's not, I I refuse that. I'm acting on faith. And then if, if it's still pressing on me, I got to think about what verse 15 says. When desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. If I do this, it will be a transgression of God's will. It will be an affront to God. 
it will be unfaithfulness to God. And that's not without its consequence. I will die. And not only will I just die in the moment, I think the idea when it's full grown is when it reaches its full end, if you just keep acting on impulse and not on faith and you keep going down this path little by little, even if you repent of this sin, Satan has entered your heart. He's had an effect on you. It has baggage that's left. And now my heart's a little harder. It gets easier the next time. And then it gets easier the next time to the extent that then I'm just living in sin and, and I'm, I'm going to lose my soul for eternity. Satan has me in his grips. And if I'm thinking through those things, what the Bible says about it, it's going to equip me to make the right decisions. We need to realize what yielding to temptation brings. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 15, I think this is what Paul means when he's talking of his past self in the present tense. This is not the way the life of a Christian is, but I think that we make the same mistake when we decide to act on impulse and not on faith. We, we wouldn't do something if we really comprehended what we're going to accomplish by those actions. He says, what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And he uses a few different words. This first doing is a word which means accomplishing. So he says, what I am accomplishing, I do not understand. I don't comprehend it. And in the context, what he accomplishes by his decision to sin is death. If you could look spiritual death in the face, you saw it, we would stop sinning. It would never be a question. But that's not how it works. He says, what I will to do that I do not practice. So I don't do the Lord's will because I'm not thinking about disobedience and what it leads to. So then what I hate that I produce is that second do. I produce death. If we just thought about it like that. If, if you had a decision to make, something you wanted to do versus something that God said you must do or something you wanted to do that God said you cannot do, and the decision to do what God's will says not to do would kill 100,000 people on the other side of the planet, but to do what God says to do would bring Him glory and save another 100,000 people on the other side of the planet, the same people maybe. I'm just trying to, let's think about it in some kind of terms where we can See it concretely. There's grave consequences to this. I think that would make our decision easy. No matter how bad I wanted it, I would realize the gravity of the situation. Well, here is the difference between eternal life and death. God's will being furthered and God's will being thwarted in our heart. We've got to realize what yielding to temptation is. Brings And in that same vein, realize as strong as the urge may be, God, remember, he's powerful and he's faithful. I can trust in him. And he told me that he will make a way of escape. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I just got to start figuring that out and, and maybe... The way of escape was way back here at the first exit. And now I'm at the tent and it's feeling a little more difficult. Well, he's providing more as well. But we've got to find that and take that. I think that's what Paul is, or rather Jesus, meant when he came back to his disciples and they were not watching and praying like he said. He said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. He says, lest you enter temptation. And that... That echoes what he said in the model prayer. This is how you, you ought to pray. Not verbatim, but these are the things that you pray about in the way that you pray. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I think it's right to say, God, just please spare me from many temptations today. And he may. But in Matthew 4, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. It is God's will that we face tests. I think this prayer and this, these words of Jesus, what they do is they echo this idea that temptation always presents a door of opportunity. Remember what Paul or what God told Cain, sin lies at the door and it's desirous for you. Slam that door, bolt it shut, don't open it for sin. And that's the idea. Don't, temptation will come. 
But as James 1 says, when it conceives that desire, that's when it gives birth to sin. So the door is temptation, and behind that door is the sinful activity. And so you pray to God that he'd grant you the strength to overcome the wicked one and not open that door and walk through it. That's the point. I'm going to be tempted. God, grant me the strength to find the way of escape that I may be able to bear it. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But that's acting on faith. That's, that's what it's like. It's, we, we romanticize it sometimes, and there may very well be in our lives at some point some grand show of faith where, where it blows people's minds. But usually what it is is not the Genesis 22 situation where Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, but many times what it is is speaking to your friend about the gospel or when your friend at school or work says, let's go do this that you know is immoral and wrong because you're a Christian, you don't do it. Act on faith. Realize what's at stake. And lastly, we must act on faith when doubts arise. And so just like with temptation, we've got to realize what doubt is. Let me tell you something. Doubt itself is not sinful. It's what we do with our doubts that determines whether we sin or not. The same thing with temptation. Temptation is distinct from sin. It's what we do when we're tempted that will determine whether we sin before God or not. And I've had people ask me before, what what do you think about doubts? So I know these facts, I know these truths, but then there's a lot of arguments out in the world that say God does not exist, and some of them seem to be troubling to me. What do you think about that? I think that we fool ourselves if we ever say that there's never an argument we've heard that doesn't cause us to pause. How do I answer that? How, what, that kind of makes sense, but I know God exists because of all of this evidence. What do you do with that? And I think that's the difference. Do you pursue the doubt, or do you cut off that supply and pursue faith? So we got to understand what doubt is. Remember in Matthew chapter 14 when Jesus had fed 5,000, told his disciples to part and go across the sea, and he came out to them in the middle of the night in a storm, and, and Peter answered and said, Lord, it's you, command me, if it is you, command me to come on the water. So he did, and that's admirable. But then when the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and he said, Lord, save me, as he began to sink. And this is what Jesus did when he saved him. He said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Doubt is a symptom of little faith. And and faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So when I have doubts, I don't shrivel up and yield to them. I work on my faith. I go to God's word. I I appeal to older, wiser Christians. I'm, I'm struggling with this, but I want to believe. Help me through these distractions of doubts. That's part of the test is is your faith genuine? And in that moment of doubt, what God is allowing to happen to you is to determine whether you are pure gold in your faith or whether you are fool's gold. And so it refines us. And that's, that's the power of God again, that we acknowledge so that we're conditioned to act on faith is that He can take something as weak as doubt and use it to strengthen us in our faith. There's a reason why in Ephesians that these things are spoken of in chapter 6 as the full armor of God, the panoply of God. It's something you put on. It's something you know how to use. It's something that you have, and it doesn't just work by itself, but you've got to wield it like the sword of the Spirit. One of them is the shield of faith. A lot of times Satan hurls his fiery darts at us of doubt, and in and, and that moment, we decide that it's easier to just put this heavy shield down and take the hit. You've got to raise it up. That's acting on faith. Raise that shield of faith and choose faith. I think that's what we see in Mark 9. You remember this man who has a child who has a mute spirit. It tells us, that he came to Jesus saying, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, 
Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they could cast it out, but they could not. What was Jesus' answer? Well, I can't blame him for that. He said, O faithless generation. Who is he talking about, the man or his disciples? He's talking about his disciples. I mean, and that was characteristic of of everyone. Their faith wasn't as strong as Jews as they thought it was. O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him to him, and he saw him, and immediately the spirit convulsed, and he fell on the ground and, and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening? And he said, from childhood, he's often thrown him into the fire and the water to destroy him. But if you can do something, have compassion on us and help us. And notice Jesus' probing question. He could have just did it, but he wants us to act on faith. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And how powerful would that have been after he just censured his, his disciples? He had just rebuked them for a faithless practice and mindset. All things are possible to him who believes because of the one he believes in. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, there's a struggle, isn't there? But he's acting on faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And so he commanded that spirit to come out of him, and it did. You have this happening, and in verse 28, when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, As they had already been rebuked, why could we not cast it out? And it says this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. What what is that? Faith. It didn't happen immediately when you first did it, and you didn't persist in faith. And so when doubts arise, we, we say, Lord, help my unbelief. We choose faith. You know, there are doubts that will arise, and sometimes they come from questions we just don't at the time have an answer to. Sometimes they come because of questions that we just will never have an answer to. But what faith does is it realizes that I have answers to questions, and those answers cannot be questioned. They're factual. I don't need to rehash them again. I may study them to strengthen my faith, but there are things that are just objectively true, and I'm not ever going to doubt that. And what that should do is shape how we approach those things that we're not sure about and that we have questions about. We sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and we're ready to give a defense to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We rest in the fact that God is true, His Word is reliable, and truth is unchanging. And So while there may be doubts, we don't yield to them, but we search in truth while we act on faith. And this is for all areas of our life. We need to be acting on faith. We deny the initial impulses of our flesh, realizing the damage they can cause, and we pursue the will of God. And it takes acting on faith in everything for us to reach heaven. I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to you, and I pray that you make application in your life. Before we dismiss to our classes, we'll be led in a word of prayer.